let's give bacteria all the love they deserve. We wouldn't be here without them. They, they were here for, I don't know what it is, like a billion years before anything else showed but up. But in a way, if you think about it, they create the matter that we consume and then and then reinc reincarnates or dissolves into the soil and then creates an, a tree. And then that tree creates more bacteria. Mm -hmm. And then that bacteria, I mean, again, again, that's why I like to think about not recycling, but reincarnating because that assumes a kind of imparting upon nature that dimension of agency and and maybe awareness. Uh, but yeah, lots of really interesting work happening with bacteria. Um, directed evolution is one of them. We're looking we're, we're looking at directed evolution, so high throughput directed evolution of um, of bacteria for the production of, Products and again, those products can be a shoe, um, wearables, biomaterials, therapeutic therapeutics, and doing that direction computationally. Totally computationally, obviously in in the lab with 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 the hero organism, the hero bacteria, um, and 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 what's happening today in in um, ecromicrobial synthetic biology, synthetic biology that lends itself to ecology, uh, and again, all of these fields are coming together. It's such. A wonderful time to be a designer. I can't think of a better time to be a designer in this world. Um, but with um, high throughput directed evolution, and I should say that the physical space in our uh, new lab um, will have these capsules, which which we have designed, um, that are um, that they are designed like growth chambers or grow rooms, um, and in those grow rooms we can. Uh, basically, um, program um, top-down environmental templating, right? Top-down environmental control of lights, humidity, light, etc. So, light, humidity, and temperature, um, while doing uh, bottom-up genetic regulation. So, it is a wet lab, but in that wet lab, you could do at the same time, you know, genetic genetic modulation, uh, regulation, and and environmental templating. Um, and then again, the idea is that in one of those capsules, maybe we grow transparent wood, and in another capsule, we you know we transparent wood for architectural application. In another capsule, we grow a shoe, and in another capsule, we look at that language, you know, large language model that we talk, talked about. And there is a particular technology associated with that, which we're hoping to reveal to the world in February. Um, and in each of those capsules is basically a high throughput computational environment like a breadboard that has, think of sort of a physical breadboard environment that has access to oxygen and nitrogen and CO2 and nutritional dispensing. And these uh, little capsules uh, could be stressed. They're sort of a, an ecology in a box um, and they could be stressed to produce the food of the future or the products of the future or the construction materials of the future. Um, Food, food is a very interesting one, obviously because of food insecurity and, 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 and the issues that we have around both in terms of food insecurity, but also in terms of the future of food and what, what will remain after we can't eat plants and animals anymore and all we can eat is these false bananas and, 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 um, you know, and insects as our protein source. So there we're thinking, you know, can we design these capsules to stress an environment and see how that environment behaves? Think about a kind of a, an ecological, a, a, a biodiversity chamber. Right, a kind of a time capsule that is designed as a, bio, a biodiversity chamber where you can program the exact temperature, humidity, and light um, combination uh, to emulate the environment from the past. So, uh, Ohio, 1981, December 31st at 5 a.m. in the morning, what did tomatoes taste like? Mm -hmm. uh, to all the way in the future, 200 years ago, these are the the input, the environmental inputs. These are some genetic regulations that I'm testing, uh, and what might the, the food of the future, or the products of the future, or the construction materials of the future, um, feel like, test like, behave like, etc. And so these capsules are designed as part of a lab. That's why it's been taking us such a long time to get to this point, um, because we started designing them in 2019, and they are currently, literally, as I speak to you, under construction. How well is it understood? how to do this dance of controlling these different variables in order for various kinds of growth to happen. It's not, it's never been done before and these capsules have never been designed before. So I, you know, when, when, when we first decided these are going to be environmental capsules, people thought we're crazy. What are you building? What are you making? So the answer is that 
We don't know, but we know that there has never been a space like this where you have basically a wet lab and a grow room at that resolution, um, at that granularity uh, of, 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 of control over organisms. <clears throat> there is a reason why there is this incredible evolution of product in the software space. Um, the hardware space, that's a more limiting space. That because of the physical infrastructure that we have to test and experiment with things. So we really wanted to push on creating a wet lab that is novel in every possible way. What could you create in it? You could create the future. Um, you could create a, a you could create an environment of plants talking to each other with a robotic referee. <laughs> and the robotic referee, we you know, and you could you could set an objective function and let's say for 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 the uh, um, transaction driven individuals in the world, let's say the objective function is carbon sequestration. Mm -hmm. and um and all of those plants are um, are uh, implemented with a gaming engine and they have this reward system, right? And they're constantly needing to uh, optimize the way in which they carbon se sequest. Um, we weed out the bad guys, we leave the good guys, and we end up with this like ideal ecology of carbon sequestering heroes that connect and communicate with each other. And once we have that model, this biodiversity chamber, we send it out into the field, um, and we see what happens in nature. And that, that's sort of what I'm talking about, uh, augmenting plants with that extra uh, uh, dimension of, of bandwidth that they do not have. Uh, they're, they're just, just last week, um, I came across a paper um, that discusses uh, the in vivo neurons that are, that are augmented with a Pong game and uh, and in a dish they basically present sentience and the beginning of awareness, which is which is wonderful. Yeah. Like that that you could actually take these neurons from a mouse brain and and you have the electrical circuits and the physiological circuits that enable uh, these cells to connect and communicate and together arrive at sort of a swarm. A situation that allows them to act as a system that is not only perceived to be sentient, but is actually sentient. Um, Michael Levine calls this agential material, material that has agency, right? So, uh, uh, so, so, so this, this, this is of interest to us because this is sort of again, this is emergence post templating. You template until you don't need to template anymore because because the system has its own rules, right? What we don't want to happen with AGI, we want to happen with synthetic biology. What we don't want to happen online and software with language, we want for it to happen with, with bio-based materials because that will get us closer to growing things as opposed to assembly and and mechanically, yeah, putting them together with toxic materials and compounds. <laughs>